Um, <laughs> if you look up here, that is a plexus, right? Why? Well, you see that the spinal nerves will come out and then they kind of branch out and join other branches. They all mix with each other, sort of like a little mesh um, or a net. If you look at over here in the thorax, notice that each one comes out and does its job, comes out and does its job. They're not really communicating with each other, right? So that is, um, that's essentially what a plexus is. When you have those roots come out and then they start to um, spread out and join each other in other areas. So it's like a mixing of those roots. So let's take each one of these Plexus is, it's actually plexi, but I don't like to say plexi for some reason. Let's take each one of these plexi and um, discuss them. We're going to look at um, where they come from, what roots they're made of, and we're going to look at some of the um, important nerves that you need to know that they produce. Okay? So there's going to be a lot of information here that you don't have to know. I'm going to point out the things that you that is essential for you to know. The cervical plexus, where is that? In the, right, your neck. Okay, so the cervical plexus is actually made up of roots from C1 all the way down to C5. C1 through C5. It is going to supply the skin and muscles of the head, the neck, the top of your shoulders, your chest, and your diaphragm. Ding, 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 ding. That kind of feels important, right? Diaphragm is one of those things that, you know, you want to have working in your body, <laughs> maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I want you to look at this picture just to kind of understand what a plexus is, how this works. Notice the yellow portions here are the actual roots coming off of that spinal cord. Now, once they come out in green, you will see that they will communicate with each other. Do you see how they kind of all spread out and join each other in different areas? Yes, that is what a plexus is. It's that network of those nerves mixing with each other. So they're going to communicate and mix and give you several nerves at the end, something like the lesser occipital, the great auricular, the transverse cervical, Blah, 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 and also the front end. Okay. <laughs> I can't circle it any more than that. So just judging from my circles and my notes, it's probably really important to understand the roots of this plexus. Actually, the roots of all the plexi. But where does it come from, C1 through C5? What does it innervate? When I talk about a nerve and I say innervate, it means where does this nerve go? What does it control? Okay, so you should know that the cervical plexus originates from C1 through C5, and it innervates the head, neck, top of the shoulder, front of the chest. Okay, and that phrenic nerve comes off of it. Why is the phrenic nerve important? Because the phrenic nerve is the nerve that innervates the all-important diaphragm. Okay? So if you lose the phrenic nerve, you lose the function of the diaphragm. And that's not, generally not a good thing to do. <laughs> Sometimes you want your diaphragm. I don't know. Anyway, so... <laughs> Everything you need to know about the cervical plexus is on this one slide. The following slides will have a summary of all of the nerves that come off of it and what they do, okay? Um, so you can read over those if you want. You better know this one right here. That's important. Okay, let's go on to the brachial plexus. I know, right? That always happens to <laughs> You know why? Because I think when you're studying, you're like, oh, she talked about this for so long, there's no way I don't know it. And then you get on the test and you're like, I have no idea what she said. <laughs> okay, and I'm going to do that with each plexus, by the way. So I better remember this shit. I'm going to be so mad. Okay, the, <laughs> the brachial plexus, let's talk about that. So the brachial plexus is actually going to be kind of fun because we're going to talk about injuries in the brachial plexus. Super fun. Where does it start? Where does it come from? 
It comes from mainly C5 to T1. What does it cover? It covers the entire nerve supply to the shoulders and the upper limbs. Without your brachial plexus, your arms and hands are useless. You cannot do anything with them. Okay. Now, looking over here, you'll notice in yellow are the roots. Those roots will actually combine to give you trunks. You have a superior, inferior, and a middle trunk. Okay. Then those trunks are going to split up over here, we call those divisions in green and light green. You have anterior divisions and posterior divisions. Don't worry, this is not like, um, I, I'm seeing a lot of looks of like, are you serious woman? We have to know this. Okay, we have divisions. Those divisions will then combine to give you cords. You've got a medial cord, a lateral cord, and a posterior cord. And then you end up with some nerves. Okay, yeah, some nerves. What nerves do I want to focus on? We're going to look at the uh, radial nerve, the ulnar nerve. We're going to look at the median nerve. And where are you? Long thoracic nerve, there we go. Okay, and down here, this is just a little mnemonic to help you remember that you go roots, trunks, divisions, cords, um, and then nerves, not a big deal. What we're going to focus on is the injuries of those nerves that I underlined because those are the ones that you need to know. So um, as far as brachial plexus goes, not only should you know the roots of where it comes from, be able to recognize those nerves that I underlined, that they're from the brachial plexus, and understand that it innervates the entire upper limb. Y'all ready to look at some injuries? This is the fun stuff here. Okay. Oh, sorry, not yet. I always forget the order of these slides. <laughs> okay, so this is just picture form of everything we just saw. This is where that plexus happens. What is that area? It's the axilla, right, it's under your arm. And under your arm seems to be one of those places that we like to injure quite a bit. Um, you know, if it's childbirth and they pull a child out by his arm, they're liable to injure this plexus. If you pick up your child by their arm, dislocate their shoulder, you're liable, you're likely going to injure something in this plexus. If you're in a car accident or a football player, they play with their shoulder, that could injure the plexus. There's a lot of things that can injure this plexus. Let's say you have a lymph node that's being removed um, from under your arm. Again, you could surgically injure that plexus. So there's a lot of instances where you are um, liable to see injuries. Sorry, guys, I was covering my mic injuries to the brachial plexus. And that's why we focus so much on these injuries because you should be able to recognize them. If you're in the emergency room and somebody comes in and they present to you with a certain um, position of their arm or hand, you should be able to recognize, oh, you've probably injured your radial nerve or you've injured the ulnar nerve, okay? So let's look at them. All right. Okay, let's start with the uh, superior cord injury. You remember what the superior cord was? It was that cord up top. Fine, okay, good. If you need to go back and look at the picture, you can look at it. What happens when you injure the superior cord? You will end up with something called Herb Duchenne Pulsi or Waiter's Tip. It's this one right here, Herb Duchenne or Waiter's Tip, along with loss of sensation to the lateral side of the arm. What does this mean? It means that you, your arm is stuck straight by your side and your hand is flexed to the back like this. We call that the waiter's tip hand. Yes, apparently waiters way back, way back in the day used to get their tips like this. <laughs> I've actually seen this. Yes, I have seen this with like bell hops and stuff that like discreetly take your tip. They won't hold their hand out, but they'll take it like this with their hand behind them. Yeah, so you like, you know, you hand them the cash in their hand and it's just very quietly put in their pocket. Yeah, it's this very smooth way of putting the money in your pocket and leaving like you didn't take anything. So, <laughs> but 
but that's what they call waiter's tip um, or herb duchenne palsy. Okay, so anytime you see that, you should be able to recognize that that is a superior cord injury. Okay, what about uh, ulnar nerve injury? So the ulnar nerve is going to innervate the medial side of the arm and those medial two fingers, your pinky and your ring finger. If you injure that ulnar nerve, you end up with loss of sensation and inability to adduct and abduct these two fingers. They just kind of curl up and become useless. Yes. So that is a ulnar nerve injury, also called ulnar nerve palsy. Looks just like this. I just now realized that these two pictures are kind of close to each other. They are, they are separate issues. So this is ulnar nerve palsy. Right there, due to ulnar nerve injury, there is an inability to adduct or abduct those uh, medial two fingers, the pinky and the ring finger. What's wrong? Oh yeah, that's that. we haven't done that one yet. Okay. What about your radial nerve? What does the radial nerve do? So the radial nerve is the nerve that innervates the muscles that extend the wrist, this is what it means to extend the wrist. You lift up your wrist, your extensors. So if you injure that radial nerve, these extensors are now inoperable. This wrist cannot be lifted up. It drops, and it stays like that. So we call that wrist drop. Back in the day, this used to be like, oh, my God, this used to be a thing in the 80s. I'm an 80s baby, sorry. <laughs> But can I just say the 80s were some of the best times ever, okay? We should all have had a little bit of time in the 80s because that was for real, like, the best. Okay, so this is wrist drop. Anytime you see someone presenting with a wrist that they cannot extend, it's dropped and it stays like that, that is a radial nerve injury, okay? All right. Do we look tired today? What's wrong? Sad? No, not yet. Ms. Patel is like sleepy today. She's sleepy. So wrist, wrist drop is my radial nerve injury. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about this one down here, the long thoracic nerve. That's the one that got branches from all of those trunks. That long thoracic nerve um, innervates the serratus anterior muscle. Remember that one that was back here with the um, ribs? The serratus anterior also inserts into the scapula and it stabilizes it. So what happens with uh, long thoracic nerve injury, whenever you uh, press out with your arms or use those muscles, that scapula tends to pop out. We call that a winging scapula. And I'm actually going to pull up a picture off the internet for you because I don't think that this picture really visualizes it very well. Okay, bear with me here. Yes, yes, they will have some of this. They can have some of that. Um, let's see, uh, winged scapula. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So this is severe. This is bilateral winged scapula. Um, do what? No, they have to flex. They have to extend. They have to extend their arms out for it to pop out. Um, this is a good example here. You see, here's your winged scapula. Do what? Oh, yeah. But that's what it looks like. This is a good example too, because this guy's skinny. So you can see this one's normal and this one is winged. You notice how it just kind of comes out forward. What is so funny? Are you trying to feel it? Anyways, but yeah, that's winging of the scapula. Okay, so that would be a paralysis in that serratus anterior muscle. Or what injury? Or long thoracic, right? Long thoracic nerve injury. I knew I did it. I knew it too. Okay. 
it's like I knew that was going to happen, but I still was resistant and just like, okay, I'm just going to try anyways. Okay. Notice I saved the best for last right over here, your median nerve pulsy caused by median nerve injury or compression. This is one that we're all familiar with because in AMP1, you took all of those structures in the wrist and we talked about how there's bones, there's tendons, right, of all the flexors that run through there. And the median nerve sits in the middle of that tunnel and all of that is wrapped in a sheath. So it's a very tight compartment. Any compression on the wrist or any swelling in the wrist will give you the same presentation as median nerve injury. And that is uh, either uh, carpal tunnel syndrome or median nerve pulsy. Now, I want you to understand that median nerve pulsy is what happens when the me median nerve is either injured or compressed. One of the reasons for that pulsy is carpal tunnel syndrome. That's the one where you know, you've got overuse of the wrist or you're constantly typing with your wrist, um, sitting on something. Anything that causes swelling in this area is going to be carpal tunnel syndrome and that results in median nerve pulsy. So you can also, along with that pain, have some numbness and tingling in the palm and the fingers. The median nerve actually innervates those uh, lateral three fingers, the thumb, the index, and the middle finger. So these two are ulnar, your pinky and your ring. These three are median, okay? Or if you want to get, if you want to get technical, it's two and a half, <laughs> two and a half, but we're going with three for the median, your thumb, index, middle finger, and then the last two will be your ulnar, the medial two. I can't even hear you, what? Oh. It's, it's different. We can talk about that. <laughs> we can talk about that. Okay, so the... <laughs> These are the injuries. Notice that this one slide alone, I could make five different questions from just this one slide, okay? And I promise you will see um, at, least, at least two of these, if not all of them, okay? Huh? Bonus questions, no, no. My bonus questions for this test is going to be on the embryology that we'll do next week. Yeah, okay, cool, all right. So make sure you know all of those injuries and uh, not only what it does, but the nerve that causes, the injured nerve that causes that. And then again, this is that chart with all of that um, summarized per nerve and what it innervates. Okay, the lumbar plexus, where do you think that is? In the lower back, right, right. Um, so lumbar plexus. Nothing really special here. Um, it originates between L1 and L5. Those are your roots. Um, there's no injuries that we're gonna look at here. There's no super special nerve that we're gonna look at. So I would ask that you understand that the lumbar plexus comes from L1 through L5 and be able to recognize the nerves. Meaning if you've got a list of, you know, um, all of the following are all of the following are uh, part of the lumbar plexus, except, and it was like a uh, femoral, obturator, genitofemoral, uh, brachial. Hello, right, or median. I just made up a nerve, all right. <laughs> okay, and that's it, because there's really nothing, there's nothing too special about it. Um, but you can go back and look at over here, um, the nerves that it does, okay? All right, the sacral plexus. This one's got, it, this one has an important nerve that we're gonna talk about. Okay, so the sacral plexus is going to originate from uh, L4 all the way to S4. Those are my roots. Those roots will come out, and again, you've got uh, your anterior 
in the light green, your posterior in the dark green, those are your divisions. And then those divisions will recombine to give you two main nerves that will actually run together right here into a huge nerve called the sciatic nerve. So the sciatic nerve in actuality is made up of the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve. Um, we just call it sciatic because the two are combined to each, with each other, okay? So obviously the sciatic nerve is a huge nerve and it is a big one that we're gonna talk about. Um, so as far as this, is it really only 1138? I'm talking too fast. <laughs> I am, I'm talking too fast. Okay, as far as this plexus goes, make sure you understand where the roots come from and know that uh, the sciatic nerve is one of those nerves that comes from the sacral plexus. Okay, and here it is with the bones. And I want to go to, I wanna to go to the sciatic right here. Okay, so let's look at what that sciatic nerve does. The sciatic nerve, made up of the tibial and the common fibular, is actually going to, why does it not tell you? Dang it. It just says the hamstring muscles and the adductor. Um, that's okay. All right. So, just, I need you to know that that comes from the sacral plexus. Okay. All right. Now we can go to the, my favorite thing. Okay. Yes, my favorite, favorite, favorite. So I wanna talk about dermatomes for a little bit. Okay. So what is a dermatome? <laughs> right, so all of those roots that we just looked at that make up uh, you know, either make up a plexus or don't participate in a plexus, all of the roots that come off of the, sp of the spinal cord, all those spinal roots or spinal nerves, not only do they have sensory and motor and, you know, go off and innervate different muscles, they also have um, sensory that comes from certain parts of the skin of your outer surface, okay? So we have made a map um, of which root innervates what part of our skin. Um, that is this right here that you're seeing. So if I'm talking, say, uh, you know, the second cervical spinal nerve, I know that it's going to innervate or it's going to send to the brain sensations from the back of my head, um, the little bit of my neck here. If I'm talking about C4, it's my shoulder mainly in the back, so a little bit in the front. Do you get what I'm saying? If I'm talking about L2, I've got this part of the thigh and then the lower back and the side, okay? Why is this important? Why do I need to know what part of skin is innervated by which spinal nerve? Right, or because there's something called referred, referred pain, okay? And we actually, uh, use referred pain quite often to help diagnose patients or at least clue you in as to what's going on. Um, and I think this is super cool because this is one of those things that you could probably like sit and read about for hours looking up different nerves and different diseases and what part of your skin is going to give you pain. So what happens with referred pain is let's say Well, let's just take a common one. Let's take a common one that we all know. Um, let's say I'm having a heart attack and my heart is innervated by C4, okay? So the heart is what, where the problem is, right? But the patch of skin that shares that same root is where I feel the pain. So that's your referred pain. It's when you feel pain in an area that is far away from the source of the pain. Yes? It's okay, because we're gonna talk about it for a long time. I can't, no, I'm reading Erica's face. I can totally, 
She doesn't even have to say anything anymore. I just look at her. Um, <laughs> and everybody that doesn't get something, and then I keep saying it until you get it, be thankful to Erica because it's all because of her facial expressions that I keep going over saying. <laughs> okay, so your heart is innervated with cervical four, spinal nerve cervical four, C4, okay? Your left shoulder, the skin on your left shoulder, and like left shoulder and back all the way down. This area, I'm gonna shade it, the part that is innervated by C4, it's right here, okay? That's the left shoulder and part of the left back. Same nerve. I cover here, the skin there, and my heart. If my heart is suffering, not getting enough oxygen or the blood flow, I can feel that pain here rather than in the heart, okay? Um, let's do another example. Let's see. Okay, T10, right here. T10 is right at the level of the uh, belly button. So, my appendix innervated by T10 also. Let's say I have something going on with it. I can feel that here in my belly button, not here. Does this make sense now? That's referred pain, okay? So that's why we have, we talk about dermatomes because we wanna understand that this map of all of the sensory coverage of those nerves is what can clue us into what's actually going on. And the reason you have that referred pain is because that organ or that muscle shares the root with a sensory portion of the skin. Does that make sense? Yes. Are you writing with an actual felt tip marker? That is so cool. I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm jealous. Okay, so let's let's put these examples, let's test them out and see what happens, okay? Uh, let's take a nerve and let's look at sciatic. Sciatic is L4, S3, okay? So the sciatic nerve, we know that's part of the sacral plexus, but it starts at L4 or takes roots from L4 to S3. So let's say I have some type of disc disease right at L4, okay? My disc is degenerating, it's pushing up against that root. That means that I am liable to feel this pain of hurting this nerve or this root throughout those dermatomes, L4 through S3. So let's check and see where L4 through S3 is. Okay, so I'm just gonna shade them in L4 through S3. So there's S3. There's S2. Oh, there's L4. There's S1. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Here's S2, S3. Okay, so I shaded it in with blue. So now I know that if I have a problem up here in the lower back at that disc of L4, I may not feel the pain in my lower back. What I can do is feel the pain in all of this blue area, okay? Because that's my referred pain. That's the dermatome that matches with those roots. Does this make sense? Okay, and that right there, what we just filled in, is actually what happens with sciatica, where you have an injury or compression or inflammation of the sciatic nerve. That pain is felt shooting all the way down your leg and your foot. Cool? All right, and you can do this with anything. You can look up any organ or any muscle, find out which nerve innervates it, where those roots are, and then come back to this chart and see where those roots are innervating on the skin and know that that's where you're going to feel that pain or where you could feel that pain if it's referred. 
Super cool. This is what we use a lot of the time, you know, because most of the time patients will come in and they have, they obviously don't know what's wrong with them, but they know what they feel and they can tell you, you know, my left arm hurts. Well, just because your left arm hurts, there may be nothing wrong with your arm. It could be coming from something else. And so if you know these dermatomes, then you know where to look. Where else can I look? If nothing's wrong with the arm and it looks like it's fine, there may be something else somewhere else that shares this root, and that's why you're feeling the pain in your arm. Cool. I think this is also the basis behind things like acupuncture um, and a lot of those pressure points that we talk about in different massage therapies. A lot of it does have to do with these dermatomes, just knowing where everything is. I know you're all going to go home, pull this up, and then start looking on the internet for pressure points and start... <laughs> And now anytime anything hurts, you're gonna come back and look and see, oh my gosh, it's gotta be something innervated by T9. And look up everything that's innervated by T9. Okay, so for this, you, you have to have that picture memorized. I'm kidding, you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but that was really cool. I should have kept it going longer. No, you need to understand what a dermatome is, understand that definition of a dermatome, and it's simply, the, the segments that are divided up here that are um, supplied by spinal nerves that, that might not be the best, spinal nerves that carry sensory nerve impulses to the brain. That might be better. Segments of the skin, segments of the skin that are supplied by spinal nerves carrying sensory nerve impulses to the brain. And then you also need to know what referred pain is, because this is super, super important. So referred pain is pain that's felt somewhere else, somewhere other than the source of that pain, okay? This is why um, if you have painful menstrual periods, right? Um, or even if you're just, if it's during the cycle, your back hurts, it's not because your uterus is like contracting so hard that it's pulling on your back. It's because the, the dermatome that matches up with what innervates the uterus is in the lower back. And that's why you can feel that pain back and coming around to the sides. Because if you follow the dermatome, you'll see where it goes. L1 starts back here and wraps around to the front. And that's where that pain is felt. Because they share that L1 innervation. <clears throat> 